Hello, I'm JW. Today we're going to have a look at this thing, and uh, this is a controller for an electric water heater. It's a Horseman BX2000, and this particular one happens to be broken as it's an old one which had uh, failed and has since been replaced with a new one. So we'll have a look at how this thing actually works, what it's actually used for, and we'll have a look inside as well to see uh, what the uh, internal construction is like. Now this is the front of the thing. It's quite a large sized item. This back piece is actually new. It's the uh, one that came in the box with the new one. I just changed the front plate for reasons we'll see in a moment. But uh, essentially how this works is that uh, this would connect to an immersion heater to heat up the water in your hot water cylinder. This will be used in a property that only has electricity, no gas or oil or whatever. And essentially it has two supplies that come in. As I say, the normal supply which is basically on permanently and then the off-peak supply which is only active certain times of the night usually and uh, two switches there just to turn those on and a few indicators here there's a little red LED as one shows the off peak is actually on which should be the sort of time supply at the cheaper rate and then additionally you've got two lights here which are these boost buttons here so in the daytime if you run out of hot water you can then press this to turn it on for an hour and press that to turn it on for two hours and that would just cancel it, uh, obviously, if you didn't want it to be on at all. And the other point of this thing is that if the boost was turned on, which is going to be at fairly expensive, high rate electricity, if then the off-peak one actually turned on during that period, then it will switch off the normal supply and switch over to the cheaper off-peak supply. So obviously you want to be uh, heating the water on the cheaper one if you can, and even the cheaper one is not actually that cheap in uh, many areas. So that's pretty much uh, what it's designed for. And this is surface mounted and uh, so it has two supplies going in which we'll look at in a moment. But before that let's just have a quick look at how Economy 7 actually works because uh, this is only designed for that and on top of that it's only designed for one specific arrangement of Economy 7 as in fact there are several. So uh, Economy 7, which is what it was called in the uh, sort of later years of it being available and currently uh, what it's called from some suppliers, the idea of this was that if you had, say, storage heaters installed, or in the case of that horseman thing, hot water as well, and your property only had electricity, rather than using the electricity throughout the day, what you could do is have this uh, system installed where you would pay a fairly high rate for most of the day for your normal appliances, and then at night it would switch to a much cheaper rate, and that was used to charge up your electric storage heaters and heat up the hot water. And the seven part came because traditionally it was for seven hours overnight. And times did vary a bit depending on where you actually lived, but typically it was between approximately 12 midnight and seven in the morning, hence the seven hour period. I say that does vary a bit. Sometimes it was 1 a.m. to 8 and 11.30 and various other combinations, but uh, nevertheless it was seven hours at a cheaper price. And if you actually had storage heaters of the older kind which you can't buy anymore, then they were actually designed specifically to charge up over that seven hour period, as the uh, charge capacity of those was basically the rating of the elements inside multiplied by seven hours. And you therefore bought heaters of a perfect size for the rooms, depending on how much energy they could contain. Now generally if you've got this sort of system it's only worth it if you've got storage heaters, because just heating up hot water and a few other bits and pieces maybe overnight generally isn't worth it, particularly now, because at the moment, and certainly it's been the case for sort of 10 plus years, the problem is that in the daytime the rate you pay in your daytime units is considerably more than you would normally have. So it's not just a question of it's cheaper at night, it's cheaper at night, but you're also going to pay more in the daytime, so you need to use a bulk of your electricity overnight on this cheaper rate to make this system worthwhile. Now originally this was called something else, it was called the white meter rate. And the reason for this is that most electricity meters were black and then when you had the one for the Economy 7 it was actually a meter in a white casing which was usually a black one that would have been painted white. So the literally was two electricity meters. So the black one was for daytime and the white one was for nighttime. And the day one was on 24 hours and was basically on permanently, and that would have supplied all of the circuits in your house apart from the storage heaters. And the night time was only on for that seven hour period, 
and that would have supplied the storage heaters and your hot water cylinder. Now with this particular arrangement, which is the older style, it was literally two totally separate meters. They're both connected to the same supply fuse in your house, but one recorded uh, completely separately from the other, and there was no connection between them. And this also meant that despite the fact that you would have cheap electricity at night, it only replied to the items that were actually wired up to the night meter. So if, say, you turned on your washing machine at night, it was still going to be charged at the higher day rate, so there was absolutely no point in doing that. It was purely wired up usually to a separate fuse box, and that just connected to the heaters and the hot water cylinder. How these were switched, there was generally either a timer, which would have been a big mechanical thing, and I've got a few pictures of those on the website at flameport.com if you want to have a look at some of those. And in later years, it was actually a thing called a tele-switch, which is a radio-controlled switch, which would then uh, contain a big contactor and then just connect the power to the heaters or not. Some of the timers are still out there. Tele-switches were more common, but uh, all of this system is basically going away now with, of course, the advent of smart meters and that kind of thing. Now, although you could have two separate meters originally, one was black and one was white, more recently, certainly in the last sort of 20 years or so, it's been the case that you have a single meter which contains both of these things. So it's a meter with two registers in it, and then the timer or teleswitch just sends a signal to that to switch between the two rates. And on that system, it can be the case that the whole house goes over to the night rate, and then it switches back over to the day rate, obviously in the daytime. However, this horseman thing, which we'll uh, just have a look at, is only intended for systems where the whole house stays on the day rate all the time, and then the night storage heaters on the hot water are totally separate and wired in, and that supply is actually switched on and off from the meter or the equipment there itself. It's not just a question of some switch changes over to the other tariff. Now, for a more modern system, which you'll generally see now, it's very unusual to see one with the two meters in, although uh, they do exist. Uh, here's an example of one of them, but uh, that's a fairly unusual example. The more likely situation we'll get these days is a single meter, and these quite often contain the teleswitch uh, switching device as part of it, so there's no separate timer anymore. Two registers in it, so you'll have one for nighttime and one for daytime. Your wires coming in from the supply will come in from the supplier's fuse like that, and that will be your line and neutral. What will come out of there will be the neutral and the line. This lot will go to your consumer unit, and that will power the various circuits for your house, the lighting, sockets, and all the rest of the stuff. And if you've got the one where it has the separate output, there's actually a fifth wire comes out of here, and that one goes to the night consumer unit, and that's where your storage heaters would be attached. And of course the neutral comes across as well, it's just generally joined into the same terminal as that one. So you've got your line, line and neutral, and then there's another neutral which comes across, which goes to that as well, obviously. And naturally there's earth wires and things as well. But essentially you've got the extra fifth wire coming out, they're normally joined externally, various combinations of that. So on this system, which is where this uh, horseman thing comes in, storage heaters are there, and you will also have your hot water there. This is only powered on for about seven hours overnight. This one is on 24 hours a day, basically on permanently. This is at the low rate, and this is on the very expensive high rate throughout most of the day. Now there is another way that this can be done, and in this case of this one you can't use one of these because it uh, doesn't actually work as intended. And the way that this works, it's a two-rate meter, so two registers in there, either separately displayed or the new modern ones just have a single line and you have to press a button to cycle through the various uh, readings there. Standard four-wire meter, so line and neutral coming in, neutral and line going out. Everything goes out to your consumer unit, and then it's either built into the meter, or in some cases you may have a separate switching device, like one of those uh, tele-switch things which we have taken apart in a previous video. And all this thing is doing is just sending a signal to the meter there, so that when it gets to overnight, it just switches between the two rates. And in that arrangement, the whole house goes over to the cheap rate, 
and then the whole house goes back to the expensive rate in the daytime. This tends to be more common now, certainly on newer installations, and the benefit of this is that as well as having all your storage heaters and other stuff, you can then connect other things overnight, so people tend to be obsessed about turning on their dishwasher or washing machine at night to save three pence on the running costs of that. And of course these days if you have an electric vehicle, you can then charge it up overnight at the cheaper rate as well. However, the problem with this is that your storage heaters, you then have to provide your own timer or switching device, because otherwise your storage heaters are on permanently all the day, and therefore don't actually take advantage of it. So in the case of those, you would have to have your own timer, and probably a contactor as well, which you then have to set up so it actually switched at the appropriate hour. It's certainly not an ideal arrangement. There may be other variations of this where the whole house goes over to this rate, but then there's an extra switch line that comes out from the meter which can be used to switch a contactor. So rather than uh, just switching over the meter, there may be that fifth wire coming out, which is the line. That then goes into a contactor, and then that is what switches on the uh, storage heaters via the uh, switching mechanism inside that. And there's a various other sort of combinations of this, but the basic two arrangements are whole house going over to the night rate, or, as we had previously, it's just a separate consumer unit for the storage heaters and hot water only, and that's only turned on for the seven hour period. And unfortunately that means the rest of the house is still on the expensive rate, and you're paying a full price for that regardless of what time of day or night it is. Now just to add further confusion to this, there's actually a third system here which is even more useless and involved. This one involves a meter, and it will have various registers in it, so uh, these are generally electronic meters, and it will have a single display, but inside there's going to be at least three different registers. Power comes in, your line are neutral from the supplier's uh, fuse there, your neutral come out, and instead of one wire coming out, so that's the live, that will go to the normal rate or the day rate consumer unit. So that's pretty much everything in your house, your sockets, lights and all the rest of it. And then the neutral obviously goes to that, we won't draw that in here. There's another one comes out which goes to your storage heaters. And those can be obviously turned on and off at the appropriate hours, generally overnight. And then on some of them you can actually have a third one, so you actually have yet another little consumer unit just for the hot water. And these may be on together or they may be on separate, and in some cases these can actually be on for the seven hours overnight and also say three hours in the middle of the afternoon. And that's called an economy 10 for obvious reasons because it's seven and three, so that makes 10 hours. And there's various combinations of these Unusual to get these now, but uh, there are certain customers that still have these rather old arrangements, and therefore they're going to keep them as long as they can, because it obviously saves them a bit of money. And again, you can use this uh, thing with those, because again, the hot water is only switched on for the 10 hours in that case, or however many hours it happens to be. So Wednesday, once the power comes on, that's your cheap rate to heat up the hot water cylinder, and then it goes off, obviously, when the meter is uh, programmed to do so. Installations with this end tend to look a bit of a mess because quite often it is literally three separate consumer units just stuck on the wall. A fairly large one for those, a smaller one for the storage heaters and just a single or two-way thing just for the hot water cylinder. Now this thing, as we saw previously, has the option of having two incoming supplies. So the one here is the off-peak supply which would come from your switched hot water connection here, so only on for a short period each day or whatever. But it also has the option for a normal supply, and this is where the boost comes in. So in terms of your hot water system on this one, you would have a connection from this going to your hot water cylinder. And you'd also have another circuit coming from the normal or permanently on condition there, which would also go to the hot water cylinder. So two totally separate circuits, one of which is on 24 hours a day, the other one is switched, depending on when the electricity company decides to provide you with power. They both go through to the hot water cylinder, and there may be two elements in there, or there may only be a single element in there, and again this is where this uh, thing comes in. So it can get quite involved here, and if you're going to deal with any of these older Economy 7 systems, it's absolutely essential to sort out exactly what system they've got, before you start altering and changing things, otherwise all kinds of bad things could happen. 
you might end up with stored heaters being turned on 24 hours a day and costing an absolute fortune or you might find that they uh, don't work at all because you've connected it to something that's not actually switched anymore and there you've got these various systems here also bear in mind that some of these systems over the years have been changed or upgraded if you want to call it that and they've actually left some of the old equipment sitting in there so the presence of an old mechanical timer doesn't necessarily mean that that's in use it could just be stuck on the wall and not even wired in anymore so if you get any of these E7 systems or the E10 ones you really do have to look carefully at what's actually there and what's actually still wired in and in use because of course it can vary considerably but in terms of this video anyway the upshot is you've got hot water cylinder with two separate circuits going through to it one of which is on permanently 24 hours a day the other one is switched on and off for say 7 or 10 hours depending on the situation that you've got now here we have three doors to the underworld which are actually in fact hot water cylinders so the way that hot water cylinders work is that it's generally made of copper certainly in the older ones they're full of water cold water comes in at the bottom like that and then the hot water is taken off from the top like that this traditionally would come from a cistern in the roof full of cold water and that's called a gravity system so the water just comes in the bottom hot water is then pushed out and goes to the outlets more modern systems will generally be a mains pressure arrangement but the principle of course is the same now i've got three of these so we can show the arrangements that you would typically have for immersion heaters now i'm going to draw these in as if it's the older style of copper ones because there's still plenty of those around and economy 7 in general is a fairly old system anyway so you'll very much likely find it in older properties now the first situation is where you have a single heating element and uh, generally you'll find that those are fitted in the side so you have the heater in the bottom and the plug on the side there and the actual heating element just goes in something like that the idea of that then is that it heats from the bottom and therefore it heats the whole of the volume of the water inside the cylinder that's the sort of arrangement you'll find on say some older ones with the one in at the bottom and you also find this on the new uh, sort of uh, mains pressure or the unvented ones again it just goes inside towards the bottom of the cylinder now some of the older ones have a single element but that actually goes in on the top generally around there and those ones are considerably longer they actually go all the way down to the bottom in that sort of shape so again it's heating up the whole volume of the cylinder so uh, again try to heat up the entire thing in one go and the third arrangement is where you actually have two elements in there generally those will go in on the side so you have one going in at the bottom very similar to the uh, one there and then you have a second element fairly near the top there and that goes in in the same sort of arrangement the idea with those is, is that the bottom element is used for the economy seven so it's only on for the seven hours overnight on the cheap rate heats up the entire cylinder and then the top one is only used in the daytime on the boost which is essentially where those buttons there would come in as it's positioned near the top of the cylinder although it's the same rating as the bottom one it would only heat up the top part of the cylinder so it heats up much more quickly and it's only heating up a fairly small amount of water therefore it's obviously a bit cheaper than trying to heat up the whole thing if you only need a bit of water to uh, do the dishes or something now there was a fourth arrangement which you definitely don't see anymore which was an element of this style which was very long but in addition to having the one that went right down to the bottom of the cylinder it also had another element actually fitted in as well which was a short one which only went to the top of the cylinder fits in the same hole as the uh, single one but it has extra connections on the top so you can power the two elements separately i don't think those are still available when they were last available which was some time ago they were horrendously expensive and quite frankly if you had one of those that failed it was cheaper to sling away the cylinder and buy a new one but uh, nevertheless uh, they did exist just evidenced by the fact that on the top there you'll have uh, two sets of connections rather than one let's say i haven't seen any of those for many years they uh, probably don't exist anymore now if you have this arrangement and bearing in mind we're looking at the situation where you have your two separate circuits coming in so the normal day rate and the switched hot water one which is only turned on for the seven hours this kind of arrangement is by far the simplest you just connect the switched one to the bottom element so that would heat up the whole cylinder on the cheap overnight rate and then the top one you just connect to the permanent supply 
and you can either just have a switch on the wall which you can just turn on and off as they want or you can just have a simple timer which you just press a button it turns on for an hour and then goes off later you don't really want that to be left on all the time but in this particular case it wouldn't be a huge problem because again it's only going to heat the top part of the cylinder even if someone left it on by mistake all the time the night one will still heat the sort of two-thirds of the bottom of the cylinder there on the cheaper rate the problem occurs when you've only got a single element, like say the one at the bottom, or the very long one that goes through there. One element, but you've got two separate supplies to connect to it. And then of course that's what this is for, as this will then switch between those two rates, depending on which one is on. So off-peak supply comes in, permanent supply comes in, but crucially there's only one actual element connected to this, and this internally will switch between one of the supplies but of course not connect them both together at the same time. Now you can actually use this with this arrangement as well if you want to as this can have either a single element connected or two elements. If it's two then it's basically the two supplies come into this and then there's two element supplies come out, one for the bottom one which is your sort of night time and then the top one is just for the boost which comes from the normal supply and this does actually do both of those things. So again there's quite a variety of different connections you've got here but whether you have one or two you can use one of these and this thing is pretty much the only thing like this on the market that actually does this so if you've actually got this arrangement then basically you're gonna to have to buy one of these and of course uh, this is about £80 or something they're not particularly cheap but on the other hand it's the only one you can get so uh, what are you gonna do? Use it or uh, not have the facility? Now let's have a look inside this thing and uh, so when I changed this one in the particular property I left the original cover or backplate on the wall and just changed the front and the reason for that is because this is what's inside so uh, we'll put this piece out of the way for a minute and see what we've got here now this is what you screw to the wall and this has various connections in the bottom here and at the top these are your earth terminals at the bottom here flex grip there for one or two cables to go out to your immersion heater or heaters and the idea here is that you bring in the supplies generally on the top or from the side or wherever so you can have two cables coming in line neutral and earth earth will go to this terminal and then depending on what you're setting up as whether it's one or two heaters you connect the incoming supplies to some of these terminals and then your heaters come in the bottom here one or two generally heat resistant flexes and again they connect to some of these terminals depending on the exact configuration once you've done that, you'll see that these have actual terminals strips on the bottom here and also on the top there, and there's 10 of them. This piece on the front, which is the uh, bit that does all the business, comes with these push-on connectors and they're all numbered. So see there we've got 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and this set is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that's on the wall and then you actually plug these onto the appropriately numbered terminals in here. Numbers are actually uh, pressed into the plastic in the back there. I may not be able to see that particularly well, but there's the ones on the top, sort of 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So when you actually replace these, it's just easier to unplug all this stuff, plug the new one on the terminals and put the front back on, rather than trying to change all the wiring and whatever else. So what have we actually got in the back of here, apart from all these connections? Well not actually a huge amount of stuff so these are the two switches they're just double pole on and off switches so see there the power going in line and neutral and again line neutral coming out same with this one at the bottom here we have this big relay which will be a changeover type so that's what's going to switch between the two supplies that come in and again just got the plug on terminals on the bottom and then we've got a little circuit board in the back here with a cover over the top a few uh, things on the side and of course that's where the uh, buttons and things and those LEDs go through. Now diagrams printed in the bottom of the case here. It's fairly straightforward to install so you've got your terminals numbered there from 1 to 10 bearing in mind that 1 to 5 is on one set and then 6 to 10 is on the other set of 5. So for two immersion heaters and obviously two supplies you've got your on peak supply which is the permanent daytime rate line and neutral coming in onto three and four and then the top heater which is the boost one connects to five and six and notably five is on one set of terminals and six is on the other one and then your off-peak supply which is your switched one on say seven hours a night or whatever 
9 inch go to so 9 and 10 and then the bottom heater which is the one you'd use to heat the whole cylinder goes to 7 and 8 and 1 and 2 are not used in that application and of course there's going to be four earth wires or protective conductors which go to the terminals provided and if you want to do it with a single heater, so just one heater that can be used from both supplies, but obviously not at the same time, then we've got this arrangement. So the incoming supply, the on-peak, still goes to 3 and 4, which is what we had previously, and the off-peak supply still goes to 9 and 10, but then we have links put in between 7 and 1, and between 2 and 8, and then your single heater connects to 5 and 6 only, so it's just single heater output which will either be powered from the off-peak supply when it's available or from the on-peak supply if someone has pressed the boost button and if someone has pressed the boost button and it's on the on-peak supply and then the off-peak supply becomes available that will be cancelled and disconnected and then it will connect to the off-peak supply so it can then heat the whole thing at the cheaper rate. So a fairly uh, cunning piece of equipment and uh, so unfortunately this is pretty much the only one that actually does this so if you want this, then this is the pretty much only one you're going to be able to get. So I've connected up to 3 and 4 there, just those. I haven't connected any the others, but it doesn't matter. They're all uh, sort of fairly well insulated on the ends there. And uh, that's just uh, where it's jokes on the diagram here. And they're actually both the same for single or dual. So we'll just uh, place that uh, sort of on the top there. Try and get these uh, somewhere out of reach here. Power-wise, using this thing, uh, just... Uh, Next in the power here and then just closes the lid, so again, not a problem with that. You can buy these, these are by Cliff, it's called a quick test if you uh, want to get them. They're fairly expensive, but generally only buy it one time. So uh, pop that in there. Now, of course, it has the connections here, so if we turn on our normal supply, obviously it turn on the off-peak as well normally. Now, we just zoom into this a bit, we can see a bit more clearly what's supposed to happen here is that uh, when you press one of the buttons it stays on for an hour, two hours and then cancel just uh, cancels it obviously turns it off. So let's press the one hour button to see what happens. So it's turning on there but then it's already gone off so I'm not going to get a lot of hot water from that. And the two hour button turning on there and it's already gone off. So uh, yes pretty obviously something has gone wrong with the timing circuit there. The cancel button does work so if we turn it on we can turn it off and we can turn it off and you, know, you can only press one at a time, which I think is how these things are designed. So not exactly working as intended. The switches do work, so if we're off here, it doesn't actually work. And we can't demonstrate it here because we don't have the other supply connected, but uh, when this was actually installed, the overnight thing was working perfectly, so again, it wasn't a problem with that. It was heating up normally overnight, just they couldn't uh, use the boost function in the day because obviously it uh, stayed on for literally a few seconds. And if you hold the button in, then unfortunately it just sort of cycles around with it flashing. So uh, again, no real help there either. So just connect that from the power. Let's just have a look and see what we've got underneath here now. This is basically just a relay which uh, isn't going to really do anything about it. Just switch on and off and we could hear something clicking on and off when we press the button. Whether it was this or something in here isn't particularly clear, but nevertheless, uh, unlikely that's going to be the problem. It's clearly something to do with the timing. So let's start by taking out some screws here. This uh, white plastic cover obviously just uh, goes over the back here. Again, these aren't designed to be opened or repaired, but nevertheless, we're going to open it up anyway. So get this opened up. It's made by Horseman Controls of Bristol. Horsemen have been in business for a very long time, and they actually made some of the old mechanical timers which were commonly used for things like the Economy 7 switching by the utility company. So let's get this out of here. So there's the buttons, literally just plastic ones with the little carbon contact on the back, all identical. I'll just press through onto the circuit board on the front there. So this is one side of the board. Here are the three switch contacts, so just one, two and three, just bridges between those two pads with that uh, little carbon piece. The three LED indicators, so two there for the one and the two hour timing, and that's just the one that for showing that the off peak is engaged. Not a whole lot else on this side apart from this chip here, and uh, just that uh, smaller device there. Now, see if we can get a view on that one. 
So there's that one, it's a Zilog part, or Zilog, depending on how you want to pronounce that. And that was the company that made the Z80 processor, as used in the Sinclair Spectrum and various other computers of that era. Obviously that's not uh, what we've got here, so that's going to be your microcontroller, presumably. That thing there is presumably just a bridge rectifier, or something very similar. Yeah, it's got plus and minus on one side, so presumably just a uh, bridge rectifier. And the rest of the components on this side, there may be a little transistor there, another one here, a few uh, capacitors and resistors there, another transistor just next to that. Those things with a zero on are just going to be links between one part and another, zero ohms obviously. And uh, not a whole lot else there, a couple of connectors on this side. So other than the uh, main chip there, not really a whole lot on this side to do anything. So here's the top side of the board with the components. A couple of relays here, just this one and uh, this one. If we get the right angle, we can uh, possibly get some of the wording on those. So you see they're rated to 16 amps, 250 volts on the contacts, which is pretty much what you expect. Usually motion heaters are about 13 amps or so. And has a 48 volt DC coil. And the other one, uh, again, pretty much the same situation there. So. They're going to be used to switch uh, various things on and off. In the middle here, various resistors there and these capacitors. Some uh, VDRs or voltage dependent resistors, or basically metal oxide resistors if you want to call them that. So it's going to be there to uh, cut down any transients on those. There's another one up here on the top. Some uh, electrolytic capacitors there. A couple of disk capacitors as well. And then we have this other 6-pin chip over here. So there's the 6-pin device there. Very difficult to get the uh, wording on these things, but it uh, should be just about visible there. And the other thing, we've got a couple of diodes there, just uh, next to that one there. There's then a diode there and a fairly standard one right next to it. And then the final item here in the middle, we've got this white device here. And again, there's the number for that one. Now, there's nothing obvious which seems to be exploded, destroyed, or ruined on this thing. There is a bit of sort of uh, dust on the back of here, but that's just going to be where heat has uh, caused dust to accumulate there. This one has been stored for five or six years or so before it actually failed, so it's not as if something sort of just blew up on day one or whatever. It's been in use for quite a while. I say nothing obviously uh, destroyed or incinerated. Generally, if uh, something just stops working, just have a look and see if there's something obvious that's uh, either not there anymore or has just cremated itself. But in this particular case, uh, not a whole lot. So let's look there at the Horseman BX2000 and where you would actually use it. Fairly limited application, certainly these days as Economy 7 and that sort of thing is uh, on the way out. But uh, if you've got a switched E7 supply or E10 supply and the permanent one and you've got one or two immersion heaters in your hot water cylinder, then this is the thing to get to connect to those. So basically you just turn it on overnight as needed. Gives you the option of a one or two hour boost in the daytime if you do actually want it. Although if you find you're having to use the daytime boost quite often, then it might be an idea just to get a bigger hot water cylinder and have the whole thing heated up overnight anyhow, because uh, obviously if you're turning it on in the day, that is going to be extremely expensive because, as I said earlier, Economy 7 isn't just about having cheap rates at night. It also means that you're going to be paying over the odds in the daytime as well. And if you've actually got an older E7 system and you're just using it to run your tumble drive or something at night, then really you need to get rid of it because unless you have storage heaters and you're going to use them excessively, it generally isn't worth it. You'd be much better off just switching to an overall cheaper rate for the whole of the day, although a few bits at night might cost more. Most usage is not at night anyhow, unless you happen to have storage heaters. So that's it for this video. Until next time, thanks for watching.